Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today, both those who are in person and those who are joining us remotely for our Women in Science and Healthcare seminar series. Welcome to the third and final seminar for this academic year, focusing on the theme of intersectionality under the microscope. Our speaker, Dr. Lisa Van Hoos, is a perfect person for our final seminar as she will discuss intersectionality and collective teamwork for the advancement of women in science and healthcare. Thank you for being here today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Stevens from the RFU Physical Therapy Program to introduce our speaker, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, Christine, and welcome everybody. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Van Hoos and tell you a little bit about her history here. So she's a clinical professor currently at the Baylor um, University Physical Therapy Program. She is also the founder and executive director and owner of the Ujima Institute and Foundation. And their mission is to improve black health outcomes in patient client satisfaction through workforce upskilling focused on intercultural development and interactions. Dr. Van Hoos completed her physical therapy degree at the University of Central Arkansas, and then her PhD and master's in public health at um, Kansas University, University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and she tells us that there was some basketball played this year around that university. <laughs> I'm also going to read about some fellowship and I, I think it's important for us to be aware of some of these uh, things that are out there for us to, to consider. So she completed fellowships at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, Donald W. Reynolds Institute on Aging, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Pride Summer Institute with an emphasis in cardiovascular genetic epidemiology. She's trained in the Louisiana Racial and Health Equity Learning Laboratory, which focuses on building capacity of leaders across the state to address systemic barriers in social inequities affecting marginalized and minoritized communities. She's a board certified clinical specialist in oncologic physical therapy. Dr. Van Hoos has investigated workforce diversi diversification and health disparities, and has been funded by NIH, PCORI, in industry, investigating socio-ecological models of cancer-related side effects, emphasizing minority and rural cancer survivorship. In the American Physical Therap Therapy Association, she's been the president of the Academy of Oncological Physical Therapy and was the recipient of the 2021 APTA Societal Impact Award. I think that's, that's fabulous. Dr. Van Hoos is a dynamic and highly regarded speaker who's worked with our program, our faculty and students, as we've looked to make curricular changes. Um, and we've enjoyed every minute of it, and we're happy to have you on campus. And so we're thrilled to have her on campus to, to speak today, building a culture of Ujima for female success. For, help me welcome Dr. Van Hoos. Greetings, everyone. So my goal is to not jack this up. That was the one assignment they gave me. So let's see if I can make this work right. So we are actually going to be flipping to a different platform. And I'm going to tell you why here in just a minute. So if you are on site, or if you are at home or wherever you are joining us from, I want you to go to www.menti, that is M-E-N-T-I.com. And this is the one time in my life I get to sound like a radio jock, so I enjoy it. And the code is 5792-1329. And so for those of you at home, open up another browser, pull it up on your phone. We're actually going to have you interact in this conversation. It's going to be a very lively conversation. So I see about 45 people online. And my very first question is going to be after this disclosure side. 
So as she told you, I am the owner and executive director of the Ujima Institute. We have now grown into the Ujima Collective. So we have all kinds of things that we're doing. Um, we actually just launched a community center called the Ujima Center, where we provide childcare, um, wellness and fitness activities, and also a place for a community to gather. So that's been really exciting. These are the learning outcomes we're going to be working on. So today what we're going to be talking about is we're going to talk about the principles and practice of Ujima. Um, we're going to talk about how do you evaluate your culture and your climate um, to make sure that you're incorporating and integrating those principles into what you do. And then we're going to identify some threats to your collective work, um, be it here at Rosalind Franklin, Rosalind Franklin or whatever institution or setting that you're in. What are the threats that are keeping you from being able to collectively work with others? Um, we're going to talk about some strategies. So we're actually going to take a moment at towards the end of this, we're going to talk about some solutions. Because I believe it is not kind to tell people, here's the things I think you should do better. And then just be like, now you go figure that out. So we're going to create some space to kind of work through those things together. But the last one is probably the most important. I'm gonna be asking you to commit to one thing. And the commitment is important because the literature suggests that if I don't have you commit to one thing, somebody's gonna ask you about what I talked about and you're gonna be like, I don't know. So I need for there to be a selfish imperative for you to be like, I committed something to myself. If I can get you to commit something, you will say that was the best talk you ever heard because it was all about you. <laughs> so therefore at the end of this, we're gonna have one thing that you're gonna to commit to do. So here's the test question. You go to the ice cream shop and these are your choices. What do you pick? I knew there'd be one human. There's always one human. All right, we're gonna give it a few minutes. We're gonna give it about 60 seconds. Ooh, there's a lot of chocolate lovers in here. There's a lot of chocolate lovers in here. Yeah, skew population. So I should put like chocolate, double chocolate, chocolate with pralines. My goodness. Okay, so those of you who are administrators, you now know that when it is ice cream day, you need to order chocolate. That's what your people want. Uh, you got seven people who are like, we, we leaving. They're like, they don't have confetti, butter pecan, we're out the door. All right. So it looks like everybody's able to get into the system. So, have you ever heard of the term Kwanzaa? Do you know what it is? Where is that? Okay. That's pretty impressive. Okay. So, I'm going to ask the people that are here on site. So, somebody tell me what is Kwanzaa? And you got to say with your chest. Kevin Harden. Because there's people at home that want to be involved. So, what's Kwanzaa? And for those of you that are away, they're just staring at me. That's what they don't want. It is a holiday. So she started you, so it's a holiday. You, she's like, I'm gonna say the same thing. If there's someone in the online space that's like, I'm not an answer. So yes, it is a festival. Yes, yes. See, you are, just keep talking. <laughs> keep talking and it'll come. So Kwanzaa is a holiday that basically honors the lived experience of African-American people. And so how I have shifted my lexicon is that I identify as black, right? That's my race, my social construct, but my ethnicity, my definition of blackness comes from an African-American frame. And so Kwanzaa is actually a holiday that recognizes our journey here as African-Americans. It begins on December 26th, and it ends on January 1st. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. So here are the seven main symbols of Kwanzaa. So you've got the candle holder, um, which is going to have seven candles, three black, three red, three green, one black. Um, you also have basically our crops. There's always gonna be an ear of corn. There's going to be a Kwanzaa mat, a placemat where all these things sit. And then there's going to be a unity cup and what my grandchildren love the best is that you get seven days of gifts, right? I can't really tell you that they're 100% sure that they can tell you all the days of Kwanzaa, but they know that there are seven days of gifts. 
That is the part that they know. The other part of Kwanzaa that you'll notice is that a lot of the colors, the reds, the greens, the blacks, um, the golds actually come from Pan-Africa um, flags. So what you see up here is you see Ethiopia, um, then you see this universal Negro improvement flag. Um, this is the flag of Ghana. We've got Ken Kenya um, and also Zambia. And so those colors have always been used to kind of signify that origin, those African origins and roots. And so this is actually the act, the creator of Kwanzaa. And part of his impetus was, was he was like, when we think of African Americans, we tend to think of them as their start being from slavery. And so he wanted a mechanism for African Americans to understand that their roots started way beyond that. And so that's why when we talk about Kwanzaa, we use Swahili terms. It's very centered on African culture. And so these are the seven principles, the seven days of Kwanzaa, where you get seven gifts, right? And hopefully you'll be better than my grandchildren and you'll remember some of them. But you'll notice here that Ujima is the third day of Kwanzaa. And so one of the things that we talk about in the African-American community is the power of numbers. And so for those of us who identify as Christian faith, right, three stands for completeness, right, seven stands for perfection. So you'll see that play on numbers in, the, in, in Kwanzaa principles. And so Ujima stands for collective work and responsibility, which is considered to be completeness. That's part of the reason why it is the third day. And so this third day of Ujima basically means to build and maintain community together, to solve problems together, to realize our interconnectedness. And that's a struggle for us, especially in Western civilizations, because our Western culture is built on what? Individualism, right? And we, we will tell it now, right? Put your boots on, strap it up, figure it out, right? That's a great day. I was talking to a gentleman earlier from Texas, right? Texas lives individualism to the point of where every year Texas is like, are we leaving? <laughs> is this the year we're going to leave because we can do this thing by ourselves? But the nice thing about Ujima is Ujima, Ujima brings you back to this concept for us to say we're going to partner towards collective work, there has to be a concept of justice. And so what you see up here on the screen is four types of justice. There's going to be a quiz, right? And now you know that I can pull you, so there will be a quiz. So we've got natural justice, which basically says that you're giving freedom to a person to live his or her or their life according to their nature. That's just natural justice. Is that something that you feel like we do well here in the United States? Y'all, if you, if, for those of you at home, people are like, mm-mm. That was like quick. No. No. Then we've got this concept of social justice, which means that every person has equal personality and their place is important, right? So we've got natural justice, we've got social justice, we've got political justice which says that we should use our policies and procedures to allow for you to have this social and natural justice. And then we've got economic justice, which says that that should allow you to have freedom over how you get money and how you use money. Does that happen in the United States? Mm -mm. There's a guy back here in a black shirt he likes. I'm trying to get my money back right now. So yeah. And so there are some of you in this room that's like, okay, Lisa, we already got that. We understood that we were connected because COVID taught us that lesson, right? COVID kind of shut the whole world down, even if it wasn't your world. You couldn't get toilet paper. You couldn't get milk. You couldn't get your favorite street taco, right? You couldn't get whatever it is you wanted to do. Couldn't send your kids to school, so you couldn't get no relief. So COVID kind of taught us the fact that there's this interconnectivity within our world, even if we intentionally try to not have it. And so this graphic that you see over here kind of talks about all the things that we learned in this network, in our social network. So things like the social instability, the financial failure, um, the, the number of people that 
passed away or are going to have long-term effects of COVID. How all of these things around the world um, were connected and there was no way for us to escape it. And so people talk about COVID as being this collective pandemic, but it taught us this collective responsibility for each other. And so that is ultimately the principles of Ujima is that instead of you looking at something from an individualism standpoint, you look at it from a collectivism standpoint, this concept that it's not just your identity, but it is your responsibility, that's a hard one for people. That's a really hard one. Because it's one thing for me to say, you can have justice, right? But it's another thing for me to say, but I'm gonna make sure you get justice. Because there's one part of that that says, I am a good human and I believe that you should be able to call yourself whatever you want, go and do whatever you want. But for me to say, I'm going to allow myself to be uncomfortable for you to have those rights, that becomes really hard for people. The other thing is, is this concept that your well-being is tied to the well-being of your community. So I learned a really great lesson today, a geography lesson, that you are, fencing, are what we would call a fenced or bordering community, which means that if I go one direction, I get to hang out with the rich people. If I go the other direction, I get to hang out with the people that are rich in other ways, right? So I got financial richness, then I got lived experience richness. Because I come from a belief that everybody's rich in something. It's just whether or not we value it as a society. And so my question to y'all, y'all being the people, oh, and by the way, I'm Southern, um, you can catch on to that, is for you that are stakeholders here at RFU, is your well-being the same as the well-being of the communities around you? Right? So if I start asking you about your access to physical activity resources, if, if I ask you about your food security, if I ask you about your comfortability, because this AC is awesome, because I'm in the middle of a hot flash. So I'm like, praise Jesus for AC. Is your lived experience here in this very, very beautiful campus the same experience as people down the street from you? And so you are the future healthcare providers of tomorrow. Some of you are clinicians and researchers right now. And are you recognizing your responsibility to make sure that the community has the same well being that you have? Because there really is two choices, right? That came from Yoda for all you Star Wars people, right? So Yoda says, do or do not. Do or do not. Yes, he said that with his full chest. He meant that. <laughs> and so if you are not doing, you have to own the fact that you are making that decision. Consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, you are deciding that I'm okay with someone not having what they need. So the other principle of Ujima is that you must be concerned with the health and wellness of your community and that community must be bound together, working together to make things right. And that's the difference as well. You have to come together to make things right. It's not just enough to be woke, to be conscious. You already lost one. He was like, mm -mm, she's gonna talk about that foolishness. I got to get out. Um, so I'm not gonna pick on him. But, it's not just enough to have awareness. You actually have to be in the work of saying, okay, how do we make this thing right? And so why is this important to you? And I centered my talk on women, people who identified as female. I really want for you that identify as women and female to understand this relationship and why collective power is gonna be so important to you. Because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Some people say a syndemic, right? But here is the data. There is a strong correlation between gender inequality, climate vulnerability, and the state of security for women or people who identify as female. So if it's biological or if, you're, if you have a lived experience where you're living a culture of being 
a female in the United States. What we find is that not just for the United States, but also for the global community, that women die in climate change related disasters four to 14 times more likely than men. So as a female, as someone who identifies as a woman, you are 14 times more likely to die in something like COVID or some other pandemic or something like her in Katrina. I'm from Louisiana. The rain is not your friend. Um, the other thing is, is that women are more likely to suffer from increased workload and loss of income. So right now we're all dealing with work, workplace shortages. So how is that impacting the lived experience of women and females here on your campus or wherever your community may be? We are also more likely to be displaced, right? And so are we already anticipating that and what are we doing to help communities where single parent, female single parents are the predominant um, household? We're also more likely to experience health problems, violence, and sexual harassment in the aftermath. So those of us in the public health arena, we're paying attention right now. Because this is when the bad behavior start, right? Because people have already been stressed. They've already been pulled to their sticking point. And so now is when you start to see the manifestation of that. And so I was talking with some PT students earlier about the fact that we're starting to see an uptick of micro and macro behaviors in clinical settings and also in educational settings. And particularly, it's focused more on women. And then when you add in that intersection of African-American, Hispanic, Latina women, we're starting to see an uptick of microaggressions and macroaggressions against them. So there are some of you right now who are like, I philosophically, religiously, politically disagree with collectivism, because you're talking that socialist foolishness, Lisa. And I believe in just leaning into it. I'm just like, let's talk about it. So there is a conversation. There is a body of literature out here. This is the work of Davis and Williamson that actually says that an individualism frame is the best frame for a woman. They're like, that is the best frame for a woman or someone who identifies as female, because you get autonomy, you get self-determination, you get to pick your path. You don't have to deal with these hierarchical, patriarchal systems. They're like, that's what we want. We want women to be focused on individualism. I agree that there are some perks to individualism, but I'm also going to show you some data that talks about how that women, we can take it to a whole nother level. Because what if you learn anything from nature, is that who hunts to kill? Women. So when you look at species, the male species hunts for play. Or if they're really, really hungry and there's not a woman around, then they'll hunt food. But they tend to hunt for, for, for play. Women are often who's out really hunting for survival. And so it is in our neurological biology that when we feel like we are stressed, oh, a woman will come for you. And those men in this room that are married, y'all are fully aware of that. You are fully aware of that. And so what they talked about in this article after was why they voiced concern about collectivism is that there is a focus on social obligations, right? And you have to decide on what is going to be the balance between your individual goals and social objection, uh, objectives. And so this is one of those argument, one of these arguments that continues to exist. But I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why there is some benefit in having more of an Ujima or a collective work and responsibility mindset that does not have to take away from your individual goals and objectives. So, Tell your truth, speak it with your full chest. So individualism, collectivism, and because I am a PT, there always has to be a is depends. There just has to be. <laughs> and I'm not sure that it depends gonna get bigger and bigger. Because we like to sit up on the line. You got 15 more seconds. And we are, we are very split. 
So like in the United States, and I'm sorry if there's anybody on the virtual that's from another country that's gonna be very US centric. The US is split, we're 50-50 split about what did we learn from COVID? Did COVID tell me that, okay, I need to take more time and focus more on me and my family? Or did COVID say, wait a minute, we need to expand and think about the greater society? We are split on that in the data. And so we're going to talk about this intersectionality um, under the microscope. We're going to really kind of dive into the experience of women and females within medicine and science. And we're going to look at how does this lens of either individualism or collectivism, collectivism um, impact us within these work environments. So this is an article that was published that talks about understanding the current causes of women's underrepresentation in the sciences. And I'm going to read this because I read this and then I said, okay, let's read this again. So we conclude that the differential gendered outcomes in the real world results from differences in resources attributable to choices, whether free or constrained, and that such choices could be influenced and better informed through education if resources were not directed. And they say, wait, there's more. Thus, the ongoing focus on sex discrimination in reviewing, interviewing, and hiring represents costly misplaced efforts. Society is engaged in the present in solving problems of the past rather than addressing meaningful limitations. Somebody said, mm. you felt it, didn't you? Because they basically said, y'all are making stuff up. You are crying, you are crying about the wrong things and maybe it is time to move on, right? And here's what's interesting about this. She said, yep. What was it up about? So the comment that was made from the audience is that we are taught, we are taught to think things about our own subgroup that may actually harm our subgroups, right? And so one of my favorite quotes talks about how that the one of the best weapons of the oppressor is one of the oppressed people, right? And so I'm not saying that there's not, there is some truth in this. I do believe that sometimes we move into an overly reactionary space, but I would not say it's misplaced effort. I would not say it is misplaced effort. And so what you see here is this is a, a graph from 2020 that talks about factors related to retention, success, and equitable participation in academia. And so what do you see, what pops out to you on this slide? Level of depth, right? Because the gender pay gap is a real thing, right? So if I already have lived my entire life getting paid less than what someone else does based on their body parts, are based on how they identify. Now I'm gonna go into academia where we still know that there are pay differences, right? That's gonna be an issue. And if I'm trying to obtain additional degrees, now I'm getting myself into further debt. What else pops out to you? Huh? Gendered culture. Give us words, tell us more. Yes, so what she was talking about is how we, we assume certain roles, certain genders to different roles in society, right? And we also often talk about society just from a binary place. Um, so there's that component of that as well. Anything else pops out to y'all? Yeah, so what he, what he just talked about was the conscious and unconscious bias and like, even in the previous slide, I just did that, right? When I talked about that particular author, I don't know what her lived experience is and why she decided to write that article, but I definitely put a judgment on her. Why is like, why are you not with your people? What's wrong with you, right? So there's always that opportunity for us to challenge kind of those stories that we have in our heads about people, including females and those that identify as women within academia. Because 
one of the next studies that we're going to talk about is going to talk about how that some of the largest microaggressions against women are from who? From other women. And so this is a study from 2016 that looked at workplace incivility towards women. And this was a really interesting study. And so what they centered their study on was this concept of organizational justice, right? Because we talked about how with the GMO, we're going to be focused on collective work and responsibility, but then that means we've got to be moving towards something and that something is justice. So in this particular paper, what they talked about was different types of justice. So you've got the distributive justice, which looks at, okay, is there justice in decision outcomes? Then from there, we've got procedural justice, which says that, okay, what was the process to get to that outcome? Who got to come to the table? Somebody said, mm, the doors of the church are just open for that person. <laughs> Somebody felt that in their soul, right? So who gets to be in the process? So that one looks directly at process. Then the next one is interactional justice. This is the hot topic right now in regards to incivility. And yes, I'm gonna wipe the sweat off my brow because I told y'all I'm having a hot flash. So it is real. And I have been having hot flashes for 14 years. So whoever lied and told women that it was short term, <laughs> you get their medical license taken from them. So interactional justice is the hot topic right now because that's that interpersonal treatment. That interpersonal where when you're like, okay, I'm having a conversation with you and you might have said something that you don't even know was offensive. And now I'm trying to read, did you do it on the sly? Or are you just ignorant, right? Because now we're having those conversations all the time because we're trying to show up as our authentic selves. So then that means there's gonna have to be uncomfortable conversations because we're no longer trying to agree that we're all gonna do dominant culture stuff. So that means this interpersonal clash is going to happen. And so this interactional justice says, do we have systems in place that allow me to say, hey, I don't particularly like how you just said that to me. And here's my reasons why. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying what you said triggered me, right? And then under interactional justice is actually two other components. There's informational justice which says, is there justice in the explanation? So in my interaction with you, and I ask you a question, do you give me a different explanation just because I'm male or female? <laughs> and I'm sorry, people are right. Somebody over here was like, because <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. And I will tell y'all, this is probably the injustice I fight with the most. Because as a woman and as someone who identifies as female, I find that people give me a very different explanation than my male peers. And it drives me crazy. And then if you add on my blackness, oh, sometimes I'm like, oh, y'all just not gonna tell me nothing. <laughs> nothing, right? So informational justice is one thing that like, it's a low hanging fruit. So like for those of you that are in educational programs and clinics, just looking at the way in which information is distributed in your clinics, in your educational setting. Why does someone have to come to somebody to get information? Can you put it in a public space where everyone can access it? And then the next thing is interpersonal justice, which in that case, it's sensitivity, right? And in this case, what we're talking about is, what is your name? Crystal. So if Crystal comes to me and says, Lisa, the way you look at me, sometimes you, it makes me feel a little creepy. Cause you know, with the bald head and the intense eyes, I'm like, is she mad at me, right? So the interpersonal justice says that I need to recognize the fact that how Crystal feels is very real and very valid. And so I need to say, okay, Crystal, how can I do better? Now, a lot of times we will respond to that with defensiveness. Okay, that's not a just response. Justice is about fairness and equity. And Crystal just told me what she needed. If I decide to not give her that, then I'm causing an inequity, right? It is that simple. 
Justice is about giving people what they need. And so the hypothesis of this article was that women would be more negatively affected by incivility towards women compared to men. And this was based off of an old 1970s theory that if I share an affinity with you, I tend to side with you. Here's the results. It was not true. It was not true. Men actually were more affected by incivility towards women than actual women were in this particular study. And they had a fairly large sample size. All right. So the story continues. There's about, so this is um, research from Gabriel et al. This is 2018 research. Well, what they found is that there's consistent evidence that women report higher levels of incivility towards other women from other women compared to their male counterparts. And in other words, women are more rude or ruder to each other than they are to men, and also than men are to women, right? So does your workplace primarily encourage an I or a we? What's your thoughts? An I or a we? There's some collective processing going on in the room. For those of you who are online, there's a few dyads going on, a few pairs. All right, so here's my next question. Have you faced incivility in the workplace? And our IT person is like, girl, if you don't start talking faster, I'm going to start talking faster. I'm going to land this ship. I'm going to land this plane. And so this is comparable to what we see on a national level, right? But if you ask most people, educational setting, clinical settings, just personal settings, most people will say that they have faced some type of incivility in their lifetime. And so when you think about this question, who is primarily responsible for the incivility in your lived experience? And don't put their name. Don't be putting people on blast. We're not gonna put people on shame patrol. But who is primarily responsible? And it could be a variety of people, but I wanna see what your responses are. Myself, a woman, our female co-worker, we don't know if she's cis, cisgender or not, those closest to me, that is very true. That is very, very true from the literature. Um, men, my partner, my colleagues, we see a lot of female, a lot of women, a lot of peers, a lot of colleagues, capitalism and greed, Older professors, right? So there are some generational differences there in regards to how people perceive um, conversation and authority. Some people said high status people, older men. Somebody said they're boss. I'm glad you didn't put a name because that person's in this room. So what is the first step in creating a healthier, more inclusive work environment? So when you think about those examples of who maybe has have been in, in civil to you or have shown incivility to you, how do we make it stop? How do we create a culture that says, if I traumatize you, I realize that I'm also hurting myself because we are connected. Because if I'm going to be in civil towards you, if I'm gonna show incivility towards you, I have to dehumanize you a little bit, right? So what is the first step in being able to create a more healthier, more inclusive work environment? Let's see what ideas y'all have. Open communication. And there's some really good things going on on your campus right now to allow you to have these uncomfortable, these difficult, 
these tight conversations. And that's okay. They're supposed to be uncomfortable because you're two humans having an interaction. So there's going to be a little tension. That's to be expected. Tension is how we get growth. So I see a lot of communication. I see a lot of education, representation. Vocalize it and address it, right? Can we create environments where you can say, this triggered me? Doesn't mean that your perception is right or wrong, but it means that your perception is valued. See people not as objects, acknowledgement. People want to be seen, address the issue. Somebody wants some formal training. There's some other people in the room that's like, no, no more formal training. But there are ways in which to do formal training, and it doesn't have to be that God bless it online module where the person is talking to you. That you need to be in a room with other humans because that human interaction is what we need to work on. Trauma informed awareness. I love that. And whoever this smart priest person is, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to come out of frame. This goodness here, where it talks about first look at your own actions, that is key. That is key in this conversation. So I'm going to quickly kind of walk you through some solutions. So when can women close the gap? Basically what this article talked about was that they found that there were sex-based differences in rewards that included salaries, bonuses, and promotion. There are people in this room that's like, we're not talking about that. We knew that. But what they found out was that in highly prestigious occupations, women performed equally, but were rewarded significantly lower than men. But check this out. Only a higher representation of female executives at the, at the industry level enabled women to reverse the gender gap. So whoever put representation, that is key. But it's got to be a female leader that's not going to traumatize other female leaders. And so there are those of us that have come up through the ranks. And although we look like a woman, we function a lot like a very masculine type of leadership, which isn't a bad thing. It's just we weaponize it towards other women. And so that has to be stopped when you talk about female leadership. The other thing that they talk about is that for solutions, we need to have more women in leadership roles, and there needs to be some intentionality. So if you look at this one, this is a study where they implemented what was called faculty first, right? And so what faculty first did was it said, okay, we're going to structuralize. We're going to look at our policies and procedures and we're gonna close those gaps. And so what they found was that female fa faculty were being compensated at lower levels. Um, also time to promotion was about normal. So the biggest issue here was pay initially. But what they found was that with faculty first, it normalized everything. It made female and male compensation similar. So if you see this p-value is not significant, it also even closed that gap between average time to promotion, made that even more insignificant. Um, so what they talked about in this article is that we can create a more inclusive environment for females, but it requires a certain amount of intentionality. We cannot do it just with hopes and wishes and goodwill. There has to be a structured program to make these things happen. And so that dimensional model of women empowerment also has to include a relational and a societal component for it to really have impact on the, the lives of women um, within academia and also clinical practice. And so there's a lot of conversation right now about climate versus culture. And it's important for you to know that these things are different. So climate is the group's attitude. And climate varies, and it's based on perception. The culture is what is woven into your, the fabric of your institution. It's what is, it does not matter what the day is, even if it's a crappy day, we're still going to function in a certain way. And so can RFU get to that point where your culture is inclusive to women just as much as it is to men? And so I have had the opportunity today to look at some of the data to talk with a variety of people. And there's an opportunity here because RFU still kind of functions in this place. I would say there's a high hierarchical um, undercurrent 
But then there's a lot of really good functional leadership as well. When I think about the culture and climate of the institution. So the goal would be is to how do you have some solutions that would allow you to have highly engaged, proficient, entrepreneurial cultures and climates. And what that means is, is entrepreneurial cultures and climate would allow you to say as a female leader here on campus, as a female student to say, here's what I see. And here's my ideas on how I could make it better and people be open to listening to that. Doesn't mean it's gonna change overnight, but people will at least be open. How do you create that culture and climate here consistently across all programs? Because there are some programs that are doing it, but how do you weave that into the institutional fabric? And so when you think about your work environment, be it a student, a clinician, a faculty member, what I want you to think about is what is the language that's being used about all people, not just about those of dominant cultures. What are the artifacts and what are the symbols? Who is overrepresented? Who is underrepresented? What are the behavioral patterns, right? So if you're a female at RFU, are you being told that you have to dress and look a certain way? And often that dress and looking a certain way is being told to us by another female, right? Also, what are the values and what are the basic assumptions about you being here on campus? And so because that climate and culture basically communicates the unwritten curriculum. So even though like RFU has this beautiful agenda right now, everyone's looking at their curriculum from a Jedi standpoint, that curriculum means nothing if what you are learning as a faculty member and as a staff and as a student tells you that something different needs to occur. That that climate will eat your curriculum on any given day, on any given day. And so here's my last question, and then we're gonna go to some other, we're gonna go to Q&A. What keeps your workplace from changing? So you, talked about who is causing incivility on your campus. You talked about the one thing that you think needs to change. Why can you not implement it? What needs, what is keeping you from changing? Tradition, leadership, and leadership's not just senior leadership. So senior leadership gets to wear the title, but all of us are leading, right? Because if you don't speak up, you're part of that, that part, part of that culture. Money, passive approaches to change, closed-minded leaders. I see a lot of tradition conversation. There's some the arrogance. Power is not shared, an unwillingness to listen some corporate rules. I'm not going to say that. Because it's really easy for us to say the outside things. But what this slide kind of talks about is you also have to look at yourself. So what is going on with you in regards to your self-efficacy to be able to speak up? and talk about what's going on on the campus. Are you optimistic? Optimistic people tend to change cultures quicker than others. And are you open and are you conscientious? Are you aware of how you are contributing to these cultures as well? And so we've already talked through some solutions, but we're not gonna spend more time on that one, even though there's some people that's like, wait a minute, give me my time. But I do want to remind you of Brian, Brian Cave's Code of Civility. It says you should greet and acknowledge each other. You should say please and thank you. You should treat each other equally. You should acknowledge the impact of your behavior on others. You should welcome feedback. You should be approachable. You should be direct, sensitive, honest. You should acknowledge the contributions of everyone. And that's why I talk a lot to faculty can you allow learners to co-teach with you? 
can you get rid of the power dynamics and recognize the fact that for many of our faculty members, we lack racial and ethnic diversity. We lack income diversity. So could you allow a learner to stand in that space and talk about those lived experiences? Um, could you respect each other's time commitment? Like I'm failing on that one because she giving me the stink eye, but I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> and would you be bold enough to address incivility, be it incivility towards your female leaders, be it incivility towards students? Could you have that culture of Ujima to make sure that you are committing yourself to doing something different? So I don't have time to put you on blast, but remember right now, you need to be thinking about what is the one thing you can do tomorrow to be civil towards someone else so that they can have justice. So here's the take home message. She's like, it's about time. Understand that your collective power is stronger than your individual power. Yes. I want to honor all the goodness of what you have done in your journey, but you, have, you cannot do this thing by yourself. So you have to understand that collective power always wins. And justify collectivism in your brain because we are wired to think about self. Incentivize community building. So those of you who are in a place of authority, community said they need time to talk. They need time to communicate. They need a space in which to say, here's what's going on. How do you create that and how do you incentivize people to show up? And then make that time. So incentivize it and make time and then celebrate the success of other females. And that's going to require assessment. So here's where I will put you on blast. I've asked for data throughout the day. It is very difficult to get data. It is, it, it is there, but there is an informational injustice. But me as a female leader, I should be able to know what is the lived experience of other female leaders here on campus. And I should not have to beg for that. So can you assess frequently and can you put it in an open space where other females know what the environment is here so that you have that ability to collectively have a conversation together? So here's how you can reach me. Yes, I talked way too much, but they was talking back to me. So now we have five minutes for Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving us a lot of uh, work to do, which is good. Yes. Yeah. Collective work, right? Yes. All right, do we have any questions from the audience first in person before we see if there's any questions on Zoom? So if someone had said, what advice do you have regarding how to address someone if you feel you have been treated in an unrespectful manner? Best approach. Best approach is to start with beginner's mind. Right. So beginner's mind says that if I feel like I have been mistreated by you, instead of me labeling it, putting context around it, right, beginner's mind says you always approach it fresh. And so the question is, is here's how, here's my perception of what just happened. And if my perception is wrong, please correct me. Right. So you always start with beginner's mind, a place of curiosity, a place of play. Right, because as adults, we often want to defend. But you will notice kids on a playground, if they offend each other, they're like, hey, you just hurt my feelings, you took my ball, and why'd you take my ball? Can we get back to that as adults? So beginner's mind. That was a great question. Perfect, thank you. Anything else from audience? Yes, can I give you the microphone? Great. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, more of an inquiry, but have you ever implemented like this Ujima model, like in an institution, like say for here, if we wanted to instill this within like a chapter or club and like created a, I don't know, a thing. Can, is, is this a thing? I don't know. <laughs> yes, great question. So it's a, like, it's about implementation, right? So if you're going to come into a space from an Ujima mindset, then as you are making the decision process, you have to do an equity assessment. So if we were working on a project, then the question is, is okay, who is supposed to benefit from this project? Are those people in the room? Or are we just building a project based on what we want, right? 
So Ujima says that if we're gonna have collective work and responsibility, then all those people need to come into the space. So the first question is, is who's not in the space? The second question is, is, is there an undue barrier to those people getting in the space? And in that case, if the answer is yes, then how do we get creative to allow them to be in the space? And then the third thing is, is do we assess it? Because if it's gonna be collective work, then at the end of the day, I can't just look at the data and go, I thought it was great. Because that happens a lot in academia, right? As students, you're like, yeah. Because faculty are like, we did a great job. And they're like, mm, no. Right, community's the same way. You'll parachute into a community and community's like, that was not great. That wasn't even what we wanted, right? <laughs> so those are the three things. So it's that conversation of who's not at the table, how do we engage them and it doesn't cause them undue burden? And then how do we do this collective assessment to decide on success? And that is very true also for females in academia. So much of what we do comes from a male dominated culture, right? When you think about work hours, when you think about productivity measures, when you think about how we define success, we define success in academia based on manuscripts and grants, although we know that women are underfunded, underpublished, but we have not changed our promotion and tenure guidelines. Even if you wanted to keep it, you got statisticians, create a modifier, right? You could create a modifier that says that if you identify as female or if you identify from one of these racial and ethnic, ethnic groups, we're gonna modify that outcome measure because the data is very strong that says that it is not an even playing field, right? Those would be my three things. That was a good question too. Excellent. Thank you. Question here. Um, in teaching about teamwork the other day, I was quoting a, a similar piece of business literature that talked about how um, women tend to be better at working on teams, men tend to focus towards uh, working individually, and that that tends to stem from the fact that we recognize individual winners more than we do team members. Even when we put men on teams, we still have to pick a most valuable player at the end so that one <laughs> male wins. Yes. So how do we do a better job recognizing team success and not putting it on one person that, that, uh, that would then focus on, on the individual effort? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question, right? So here at RFU, could you maybe have awards that are team-based, right? and awards that incentivize you having a diverse team, however you wanna define diversity. Because awards are all based on some rules that somebody wrote. So RFU is just one decision away from doing it differently, right? So if you don't want to promote individualism and competitiveness that may be toxic to your environment, then how can you still support competitiveness but at a team-based level? And that's just one quick decision. That's just like a delete, type in based on a, a team and define team. Um, the other part of that is also, could you potentially look at ways in which to have a team also include community, right? Because you're here in a community, can you get outside your doors and include them as well? So, because you'll find that community very seldom wants just an individual. They want a whole team. So, yeah. yeah. I just so happen to be on the University Awards Committee, so. <laughs> she got a really but She gonna make it happen. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a great question. That was a really good question. Any other questions in the room? Oh, thank you so much. I don't really know how to formulate this question, but going off of what we were just talking about, I feel that often the minorities are asked to be on multiple teams in multiple aspects and are in, can deal with ideas of like burnout and being involved in too many things. And so how do we combat that or how do we involve people to the table without over utilizing, for lack of a better term? Oh, that was good. People. So the question was about like the minority tax, emotional labor, if we're gonna go to a teams based approach, but we know that we don't have enough people from certain groups, we're just gonna burn them people out. Could I challenge you to reframe that? Because 
you don't have enough people in this setting. There's a whole world out there, right? And so what often happens in academia, that's why we're called the ivory tower, is because we've decided that this group of people are highly qualified enough to walk these halls. So why could you not open your doors to community and say, we need more black voices. We need more transgender voices. We need more rural voices. And we don't have those people represented. So can you come in or can we come to you? That would be even better. But that means we've got to change our definition of who's qualified and who's valued, right? And that also comes from a very individualism mindset. Because if I've decided on my worth as an individual, then therefore I get to be able to judge somebody else. But if I'm focused on the Ujima principle, which is collective work and responsibility, I just need that person. I don't have to judge them. I just need, I know I have a gap. I have a deficit. And that person is an asset to me. But if I come from an individual mindset, that person's a deficit to me. So it's, it's a matter of reframing it and who we deem worthy to be in the group, in the team. So yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from in the room or on the chat? All right, well, if that's the case, I will hand over the microphone to Dr. Elliot to help us finish up. Well, on behalf of the Rosalind Franklin Women in Science and Healthcare uh, Symposium, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Van Hoos, for uh, really rounding out our whole year, which has been on the topic of intersectionality and in, in uh, women's in advancement in uh, science and healthcare. We've got a lot more work to do, and this is not a one-off. You know, the uh, the multidimensionality of uh, of gender and, uh, needs to continue and. Um, it's something that I think as a university, we're, we're making strides, but we appreciate the work that's, that's left to do so, yes. and to take a collective approach. You know, we started uh, on the topic of centering Black women in, in mental health with Gianni Lewis, and then we discussed the gender pay disparity and, and, and multi-dimensions of pay disparity. And so this really uh, takes us closer to the solutions, I feel like. So awesome. really, thank you so much. And Here's um, just a few tokens of our uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, Women in Science and Healthcare uh, appreciation. So if we could just uh, give another round of applause for Dr. Van Hoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I am, I am a big old kid. And so um, for those of you online who are like, what's in there? Um, there is the world's first barista standard usable, reusable cup. And centennial, I, our centennial, uh, oh, Rosalind Franklin's 100th birthday, which was a couple years ago. Thank you so much. And I told some people earlier I am addicted to coffee, so that's good. That's good. And then there is a book in here. Yeah, this is a wonderful oh. biography of our namesake, Rosalind Franklin. And um, uh, talk about uh, resilience and grit. And she's such an inspiration for all of us and for this, uh, this uh, speaker series. Awesome. Well. Okay. So I'm doing a whole infomercial. Yeah. And then <laughs> I have a bag to pick up my groceries. Thank you so much. Well, that is you very so kind thank of you. Thank you all for joining us both yes. uh, live and, uh, and remotely. We look forward to our seventh annual symposium, which will uh, be this September 2022. Thank you again. Have, have a nice evening.